Hi. Fortero Glair and Oct Agus Boykas the Nama Hogan to convey Port Chuklin. Tom Kunma Scott on a Scara Livanish. Um, Tommy Dun Shok on the Swinti Ahonigamak, um, Asan Gerdin Ahaulu, uh, Kurka Shulami Mehev, a Rhine Lish and Pobble. You're all very welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us for this session. We're here to share the ideas that have emerged from the Reimagine workshop that took place in June this year. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. First, we are going to record the session here this evening um, and so we will be able to share it um, with a much wider audience than those who can uh, attend um, this evening. Uh, we'll share it on our websites and we'll share it through social media channels as well. We have eight people speaking tonight, so we're each going to speak very briefly. This is a taster session for you to um, gain an understanding of the ideas that have emerged from the workshop, um, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to follow up afterwards. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat for the evening, so if you want to interact with us through that, please feel free to do so. Um, and I know that um, some of the group members are part of the attendees tonight. They may want to contribute to um, um, answering questions as well uh, through the chat function. So, Fads V on sale or Fad Egg Aharu Tish Covid in Adia, Higumur Gravdina Egden of Machnev, Er Schlissenua Dantau Ki, Agus Gimuk Deshigan, Tusnu her Le Fisha Krahud and Le Hinnish, Idante Kela. So, while the world was getting turned on its head due to Covid 19, we realised that many people were reflecting on how to make changes for a better future. And this provided an opportunity to bring people together to start the journey of building a collective and inclusive vision for the Dingle Peninsula. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the Kirkogina 2030 logo on this slide, which you may have noticed on recent adverts, brochures and promotional material. For the past two years, ESB Networks, um, um, uh, Marai, Dingle Hub and NEWKD have worked collaboratively together to enable the broader societal changes required for sustainable transition. And this has resulted in the Kirkogaina Fehatruka Initiative, which was successful in a funding application to Science Foundation Ireland. And this SFI funding, along with additional resources from all of the partners, is what enables us um, to host workshops and to bring the community together regularly. So much work has been started on vision building under the umbrella of um, Kirkogaina 2030 through the development of socioeconomic um, and energy master plans for the area. Uh, over 200 people have taken part in a series of community meetings and gatherings that took place between November 2019 and February 2020. And it's lucky we held them when we did because we wouldn't be doing it now. So we took the um, information and issues that emerged from that work to give background for the Reimagine workshop. Um, these related to accommodation, public transport services, Verbert um, Nogelga, strengthening the links between agriculture and tourism and uh, sustainably generating and using energy. Um, we worked with Imagination of Things to create an online experience that would encourage exciting, aspirational and inspirational ideas. And we invited people to join us to start the journey to build a community vision. So to ensure the workshop could be participative and inclusive, we had to limit the numbers in June. And we realized that this means that the workshop was just one part of a, a much greater overall process. We're now ready uh, to, we're now at the next stage, ready to bring ideas to the wider community so that you can all be part of the process. We are starting to identify mechanisms to turn these ideas into reality. And we encourage you to get involved in ideas that are of interest to you and where you can play a role to help them to progress. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce the people um, who have been involved from the start. I mentioned that Kirkogaina 2030 is a multi-partner initiative and Dingle Hub, Marai, NEWKD and ESB Networks have been working closely together um, for the past two years to drive projects relating to the low carbon transition. You'll find details of all of these and much more information on the website kirkogainafetroka.com. And 
who are the Dingle Hub team? Um, well, we have Maggie, Nadine and myself, and we work together to build a strong and vibrant hub community. Uh, we make sure that people working on the peninsula feel supported and connected, especially if they are working or learning from home. Um, I'm delighted that our board members, Maureen Callagher, Seamus O'Hara and Brendan Tui were able to join us for our workshop in June, as did Caroline Boland, who represented our advisory board. Um, and we had very strong representation from our youth advisory board with participation from Kree van Murin de Hora, Barry Bambury and Sam Moriarty. Collaboration has been key to everything we do and we are working with many organisations listed here to identify mutually beneficial funding opportunities that will support valuable engaged research um, and will lead to community engagement and research roles that will be based here on the Dingle Peninsula. And this all contributes to the development of the peninsula as a living lab, a place where we can be central to co-creating community-based solutions for a sustainable future. It's very important for us to align with the sustainable development goals and all of the work that we do seeks to contribute to the achievement of these. I will just draw your attention um, to some of the principles here, such as co-creating solutions, joining the dots and making connections. And what we hope is that you might see these continuously reflected in the work that we do. What are we looking to achieve? Well, we want to build a flourishing community, fostering a vibrant and diverse ecosystem of stakeholders to facilitate the creation and maintenance of well-paid year-round jobs on the Dingle Peninsula. And building a collective inclusive vision for the future is an important cornerstone to achieving this goal. And I hope you'll be inspired by what you hear here this evening to get involved and to help make these ideas a reality. One thing that I have to note is that not every area of interest and relevance to the peninsula has been covered by these ideas. One of the most notable of these being agriculture, but it's important to state that uh, much work has been done in this area through other projects such as the Anaerobic Digestion Feasibility Study, the EU Skin Project and the IoT Farm Ambassador Projects. And this work must be also be weaved into the overall vision in time. I mentioned already that collaborative links with different organisations were leading to funding opportunities. And I suppose I'm very excited to announce tonight that the, the Dingle Hub, through collaboration with TAGASC, has received 220,000 of Horizon 2020 funding to enable Kirkagina to be a sustainable innovation pilot um, for the EU Plutus project for the next three years. And this will essentially allow us to build on all of the previous work done in the agriculture sector to strengthen the links between agriculture and tourism, to help generate new agri-food and agri-tourism businesses. We'll be bringing you much more information on this project in the coming weeks, but it's, it's just some good news to kickstart our night. So with this in mind, know that opportunities exist to progress all of the ideas you hear. And Kirkogoina, with a growing reputation as a living lab, is ideally placed to avail of these opportunities. I'm now going to hand you over to Vitter Fair from Imagination of Things, who expertly guided us through the workshop in June. He will take you through an overview of the concepts um, and before we then hand over to the individual groups to share the ideas that emerged. Over to you, Vitter. Ah, just a second. Um, first, just to give a little bit of context, um, we are uh, a creative studio based in Amsterdam, so you might ask uh, why uh, these people were involved with uh, uh, Dingo Peninsula. Um, we, are, we feel very uh, thankful and blessed that one of our partners is a uh, Dingo man, <laughs> that's how he likes to say. Uh, and that's uh, how we, we made the connection with the, the Dingo Hub. And this is a, a type of work that we have been doing for a while, but I think it was probably the first uh, experience where uh, it felt really grounded. It felt um, 
deeply connected to a community that was eager to change and to do things and to uh, propose instead of just react. Uh, as you can imagine, because of the whole uh, pandemic situation, a lot of the projects or groups that we have been um, interacting with, um, they are doing something that I would like to call reacting. Uh, and it's, of course, it's fair. Uh, we all, in some capacity, we, we need to um, react and adapt to what's uh, happening. But I think one of the most fresh and interesting uh, elements uh, from my uh, point of view, so an external point of view, uh, uh, not knowing all the details and, and the heritage and the history of the peninsula, not knowing a lot about the background of um, the participants, it was this desire to propose, to proactively uh, imagining uh, uh, propositions for their future instead of just reacting. And the reason I like to highlight that is just because then it's the type of imagination that it's, it feels more sustainable because it's not reacting to what is happening just now. It's taking the opportunity of what is just happening uh, as a way or as this perfect environment, perfect excuse to dare to change, dare to think um, uh, the, uh, what are the, the, the possibilities. Um, the other thing that I, I think was really interesting for me, um, it's an assumption that I think it was confirmed. Um, let me just, one second. Um, I always have this, because most of our work is engaging with groups so it doesn't matter if it's like five or 50 people. Um, there is this assumption that friction is, um, it should be, um, you shouldn't shy away from friction. Every good group of people trying to do something, they will um, come across some type of disagreement or some type of a process um, to reach uh, consensus. And I think, uh, for me, this was really special because I think the ability to go through that and try to articulate and, and reach uh, consensus inside each group, but also overall uh, with every participant was something that uh, it made me feel very inspired. I think a healthy and active community is not a community that has no friction is the community that have its own ways to deal with that, to engage, to uh, overcome uh, those frictions. And I think if nothing else, that was the thing that the workshop uh, was able to put together, which is like strategies to transform friction into um, propositions. Um, so, what I wanted to go over super quick, I'm not going to read uh, the website. Basically what we did was uh, we organized um, the final concepts into uh, categories, let's say. The first category was like new dialogues and connections. Uh, that basically means um, what are the new possibilities for the peninsula to have dialogues with other regions, uh, which is something that I think it's really interesting uh, if you start thinking less inside the hierarchy and the kind of like the diplomatic bureaucracy that we probably have in every country uh, and what that can um, spark. So uh, you have ideas that basically try to touch on this connection. The, if Digo, the Dingo Peninsula could talk, what it could say, and maybe more important, with who? Uh, with who the peninsula wants to talk to? Um, it's, so a lot of those ideas are about that connection. One of the things we did is 
uh, not only you have the ideas, but for each, uh, let's say, direction, we also have uh, super small um, insights that they, they didn't become a full idea, but they were like really uh, refreshing. So we also highlight them. So for example, for the new dialogues and connections, one of those um, uh, insights that you're probably going to be able to connect with uh, one of the concepts, the playground for discoveries, the insight is um, this whole idea of like open calls and long stays. By open calls, I mean, uh, what if the peninsula can uh, kind of agree on what type of talent or what type of capabilities it wants to attract. And it doesn't have to be um, uh, permanent. It can be a long stay. So it's, it's this idea of like borrowing from artistic residencies or this kind of like temporary innovation labs uh, where you could not only disrupt how seasonal most of the tourism is, but qualify that. So it's the time for us to also rethink what is tourism. So there's a new category waiting to happen here. And I think um, from different um, groups and different ideas, I thought um, a lot of traction around that. Uh, another one was, um, it, it's, it might sound um, simple or, or unrealistic, but I love the idea of like, okay, now that Dingo uh, is able to talk and what is it, what is the content of the, that dialogue and um, with who? Um, this idea of making it official. So what is the Dingo foreign affairs? Um, are we going to have Dingo embassies? Uh, what is the job description of that? What is the uh, vision for that? This idea that the peninsula can engage in meaningful interactions with other regions that share common values, that there is, a, there is a dialogue to be made and how can something like that facilitate. Uh, another example is the other uh, route, which is the systems and resilience, which is probably the most uh, community centered because it's all about how uh, to build local resilience. It's very connected to the idea of what is it that we can do um, to rely less on um, external factors and, and also how to uh, don't, don't put the region in a, in a position that it feels uh, vulnerable for whatever is happening in the world that you can just react. So how to be a little bit more proactive about that. Um, and then we're going to have a few uh, insights. One of the insights here that I loved was the culture on wheels. There's mobility was a big uh, part of the conversation. And I really like the idea of instead of like building things uh, around the peninsula, also putting things on wheels and, and, and using that as a way to decentralize all the opportunities, all the cultural activities, all the um, interesting things that can happen. Uh, there are more examples like that. I just encourage everyone to enter the website. Um, the last thing I, I, I wanted to say is that there is also, a, as a, let's say, trademark of the type of thing we do, there's a really uh, playful um, uh, experience that called the Dingo Invention Generator. We're basically putting together a, a sentence uh, that looks like an invention, but it's basically uh, all the vocabulary that we shared in the workshop. We took all the words and we just uh, trained this little algorithm to uh, put together a sentence uh, that, that they, they feel like it's a, it's a new invention, uh, but it's just a playful way to uh, put everyone in this similar mindset. And as a visitor, you can also uh, craft a little bit and add your spin into the inventions. Um, the website is the documentation of uh, most of the things that happen. Um, it's also a way to inspire you. If you are inspired, there is a, a space there to 
share your story uh, with us. This is something that is very uh, strategic and important for the hub to be able to connect with you either be, because you have a, a deep interest in one idea or you just want to be involved in whatever is next. Uh, it's unclear, but uh, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That lack of clarity with uh, passion and commitment can, can bring a lot of interesting things. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And in the very end, I will share with everyone uh, a link to a tool that you can uh, start a conversation about the ideas that you're about to listen. Thanks very much for that, Fisher. I'm going to introduce the um, speakers now. And um, first up is going to be John Halstead, and he is going to talk to us about the sustainable transport idea. John is a talented artist and trained as an engineer, so he helped represent both our creative and technology sectors. I'm going to share my screen again now and hand over to John. And good evening. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, just a quick word about the, the subheading you see here. It uh, implies that this idea is uh, merely for tourists. It's not. It's for the community. Um, that the tourists will benefit from it is, is a byproduct of, uh, uh, of the idea. Um, we looked at the problem caused by the number of tour coaches that come into Dingle and go on to travel around Slay Head. Um, as most of you know, um, they travel on roads which aren't ideally suitable for large coaches, um, particularly the stretch from Kilvica Downing through to Dunquin, uh, where if they meet oncoming traffic often log jams, startup accidents happen. And for the communities who, who, who live along that section of the route, it, it's a serious problem. The way we looked to come around this was to have um, a designated coach park uh, on the uh, perimeter of the town. Um, Fortunately, we have this, this new road that's being built going from the new, hos, uh, new hospital um, and runs parallel to Main Street, um, a, a route that, where the coaches could be diverted and would be led to um, um, a designated coach park where their passengers um, would be offloaded. Um, there would be a reception centre of sorts there offering various experiences for the people who arrive. This could be ongoing trips in more suitable vehicles, um, touring around Slayhead, but not just Slayhead. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't have tour buses, minibuses now going over Connor Pass to the northern side of the peninsula, to the various villages uh, uh, around, uh, uh, around the peninsula. Um, You could have many offerings that, that not everybody might want to uh, travel around. You could, people who, who are in the bike hire business, for instance, could have their outlets there. Um, restaurants, pubs could advert their business there and perhaps provide transport for, for any tourists who wish to go there. You could have um, small short-term car hire systems. Um, the only limit to what can be done really is, is your imagination. Um, what it does do is take the load of the coach away from the infrastructure to the west of Dingle, um, making life more pleasant for everybody, I think. It also takes the coaches away from the um, seafront, where most people like to see the harbour and the seafront rather than the back of a bus, um, and, and 
hopefully would would um, add to the experience of of, of everybody. Um, now we used as as a, an indicative site, which you can see on the photograph of the first slide, the, the um, car park by the Mart in Dingle. Um, it's on the new road. Um, is nice and handy for the town. Um, getting permission to use it, getting the right to use it, is beyond me. That would have to come. Um, but since we came up with these ideas, um, as some of you may know, last month uh, an application for planning permission for the Dingle Hospital uh, Workshop has gone into Curry County Council. Here it is. Uh, many of the ideas we had uh, for the transport hub are duplicated here. It's also on the bypass and would be an ideal um, place to, to, to site this. Um, you could, you probably need uh, whichever site was chosen, some, some way of conveying um, the, the, um, the passengers around the town. Uh, this could be a small, we, we, I think we've mentioned here, a, a sort of trackless tram um, system which, which just circulated around the town, a hop-on, hop-off system. Um, you could also have, as I say, uh, individual transport provided by, by retail outlets, uh, pubs, restaurants. Um, I think it's an idea worth doing. Um, I think everybody would benefit from it. And, and um, I would suggest the, 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 the planning permission for this, for the hospital is, is up on the Curry uh, County Council planning site. I suggest you take a look at it. it it's, um, it's a fascinating application. Uh, it does run to a thousand pages, so it's a big download. Uh, but I, I, I think it's a splendid idea and, and would be an ideal spot um, for, for, for the project we, we've talked about now, the, the, the transport hub. I think that's about it, Deirdre. Um, so I can hand you back now and move on to the next. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, and I can say that much work is happening in the area of transport. Uh, we are going to see some newly redesigned bus services here on the peninsula very shortly, um, both on local routes and on the route from Tralee to Dingle. Um, that's one part of the journey towards sustainable transport. Um, another part is encouraging the use of those um, new services as they come on board and, and I suppose a mindset shift. But um, thinking about this process and, and biting off the bits that we can chew and changing things bit by bit is going to be a very interesting space, I think, in the short term. Um, okay, so we're going to move on next to Mary Lavery Carrick, who is a writer and educator, and she splits her time between North Kerry and the Dingle Peninsula. Um, she helped represent the education and creative sectors and also brings perspective on some of the challenges of living here full time. So she's here to tell us about a new mould, a new social living concept. Uh, the group that uh, I worked with were Mary Kiernan, John Collins, Seamus O'Hara and Trina O'Neill and we found ourselves examining alternative ways that communities might be more socially inclusive with a particular focus on the change in demographics and the needs of a growing older population and uh, while the Dingle Peninsula we were all very much in agreement is a very beautiful uh, geographically speaking, uh, an immensely beautiful location. It is its people that are its most valuable asset, and so we we focused on that. Uh, by way of a title, we came up with a new mould, uh, the crisscross of generations. We wanted to try to envisage a mould where young and old, it was very much a multi-generational 
notion that we wanted to encapsulate rather than segregating, particularly in old age, into kind of a one-way system that you would be removed potentially and possibly from your community. So that's where it came from. You may be surprised to see an image of Crow Park, but we thought uh, and amused as well, but it's for us an example of a physical feature that, uh, that has several physical features that we found inspiring. It had a center green area. Of course, it wouldn't necessarily be a playing field, but it would be uh, as a central point what a community could be built around. And of course, we'd be thinking gardens, we'd be thinking all kinds of facilities that would be outdoors. Uh, but the notion of having the green area at the center surrounded by an interconnected system where you'll see by way of the description there, there would be open and flexible living space, keeping in mind that we were particularly focused on people with aging uh, needs, uh, a space of interaction where, again, that crisscross of generations would be a very natural uh, experience. Uh, intergenerational, again, very much community space, independent living units, uh, including, you know, high dependency, because that too could be incorporated in so far as our discussions thought so. Uh, units in there for social, cultural activities, music, dance, gardens, meets up. You know, uh, I suppose the cultural heritage of the Dingle Peninsula is immensely rich. Uh, it's also very unique. Its uh, native tongue, and Tianga Gaelga, is very, very important. And within this context, we felt that the culture could be held together intact and that it could thrive and flourish. And that's why we thought as well this unit would be well worth investigating. It would have freedom of movement, freedom to choose, location, what it is one might pursue, with whom, etc. This notion of being independent and being free. It would be, of course, an ecosystem that would be very environmentally friendly, designed to ensure that everyone would belong and nobody would not belong. Um, in regards the notion, your space, your place, whatever your age, we felt that that, although only a few words encapsulated the, the core idea that was at the root of where we were all coming from in our discussion in June. And with regards to the second slide, uh, our unique proposition was that perhaps we might embark on devising a charter, a written agreement that would set out the rights of people, all people, visitors, people who live there, who, who have lived there for generations, people who have settled there, and that the rights of all people would be somehow enshrined in order to ensure that no one part of society could or would inadvertently or otherwise overwhelm another. And we thought perhaps examining the notion of a charter such as that going forward for the peninsula may be worthwhile. And from that then we felt the um, the social unit that we were envisaging and dreaming up, I suppose, uh, may be possible and it could stem from that. For us, in practical terms, the next step would be to involve people and to get the conversation going through a press release in local media, inviting communities across the peninsula to become involved, to start that conversation in all of the parishes of the Dingo Peninsula. I think there's more than eight when you take the whole peninsula into account. Uh, involve Northeast West Kerry Development because they're already involved in research that touches on where we're coming from. Participate in all festivals whenever they get back online again and on stream again, I should say, in the streets of, of the peninsula. Uh, such as being on the Beltons Food Festival of the Voices and all of the others. Uh, take an article in West Curry Live, it's well read and it's uh, a wonderful way to, to get that discussion lifted off the ground. Uh, visit other centres of best practice, of which there are many in our own country and abroad. Connect diverse groups who would all be relevant to what we're describing. And uh, then to find 
the research funding and carry out the feasibility studies that may be necessary. Uh, for us, we think, uh, given the demographics, that it's very valuable to be people-centred, to be centred on the needs of those who are vulnerable. I suppose as we age, that's where we're going. And to create a world where the crisscross of generations would become the norm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mary. Um, I do know that NEWKD has been um, uh, awarded funding through the EU Smart Villages project as well, which will hopefully um, lend support and resources to help progress this idea. Um, and the whole idea of sheltered accommodation and shared living spaces was to be very much, very much part of that proposal too. Um, so the next person that I'm going to introduce uh, is Kifa Dohora, and she represents our Youth Advisory Board. She's completed a Master's in Sustainability and she's now started working with Airgrid. So she helped to represent the needs of our youth and what a sustainable future means for them. Uh, Kifa is here to tell us all about Educate from Dingle. Hi everyone, um, I'm presenting on behalf of Group C tonight, which consisted of Orla, Dini, Kevin, my sister Marin and myself. So our proposal is Educate from Dingle. And the purpose of this proposal is to create interconnected online higher education network. We believe Dingle should be one of the first rural towns in Ireland where people can study and graduate from a higher or further education course through a fully funded and government supported online model. This model creates present opportunities and future rewards in terms of population stability, societal and economic resilience, creative and innovative local thinking, as well as making Dingle an exemplar of this model of education for the rest of the world. Additionally, we imagine our broader population participating in continuous further education courses from home, and currently this is not possible due to economic or travel constraints. So in the group, we discuss some of the benefits with this initiative. So firstly, I'll talk about environment. So there would be a decrease in travel, which subsequently would lead to a decrease in carbon emissions. There would also be a decrease in urban crowding. And then for the Dingle Peninsula, it would become less reliant on seasonal work and holiday homes would be occupied all year round. For the universities, more students without crowding the campus, which is obviously very prevalent nowadays with COVID-19. And then finally, for the students, it would create an opportunity to pursue further education from home and they wouldn't be as financially burdened. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. So what is our unique proposition? We know the demand already exists on the peninsula. Students leave to seek educational opportunities and adults seek to upskill and improve learning. Current and potential innovations then make the learning experience not only feasible, but attractive. We also discussed tracking carbon offsets from decreased commuting to and from the peninsula on an environmental point. And the Dingle Peninsula also offers an intellectual and practical opportunity to practice what we preach in a way which would be more difficult to achieve in an urban landscape. Landlords would also benefit from leasing holiday homes during the semester, which would subsequently add to GA and sporting clubs as they would benefit from players being around all year round. Students already have to spend weeks in the Gaelthuk for certain university courses learning Irish, so why not make that full time? And also unqualified tradesmen can obtain qualifications from the peninsula whilst being able to work at the same time. So what are the next steps? We want to get stakeholders on board, public school and Clochida students, guidance counsellors, educational institutes such as the Sacred Heart University, local interests such as tourist accommodation, and those with special learning needs and funding partners. We want to have a showcase day for schools and mature students in Dingo. And due to COVID-19, universities are mainly teaching online now anyways. So we can use Dingle to roll out a trial syllabus for the academic year. This in turn will help families struggling post-COVID with education costs. 
Universities also need more Irish students post COVID-19 as there will be fewer international students to cover the college fees. And we also briefly discussed some unique trials, perhaps intellectual gap years in the peninsula and subsidies for eco-friendly travel for students to conferences and parent universities. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to get on to me and go to me and Thanks very much for that, Kreefa. I know that with the situation with COVID at the moment, there are many people trying to study from here. And um, as a first step, we want the hub when restrictions permit to be able to support learners here on the peninsula, at least with the facilities they might need or to help them feel connected. So the next group would like to tell us about their plans for sensory gardens. And I'd like to introduce Dee Harmon, who is the founder of the award-winning Delish Food Tours, which is a perfect example of um, an, a food tourism business showcasing the best our peninsula has to offer and to provide a rich experience for our visitors. Um, so I'll hand over to you now, Dee, to tell us about this sensory gardens idea. Thank you. Dear Grace, hello. And I want to uh, really point out, I suppose, us coming to our senses at this time with a big shout out to people who have helped me. We call ourselves the Sensory Guardians. And that was Caroline Boland and Sam Moriarty and Kieran Kelleher and you and Lane. So we came to this idea of the Sensory Gardens and us being guardians was quite a sweet idea because we need to harness a bit of um, I suppose, um, time for the locals in their own locality. So we want to, um, I suppose, put the spotlight on points we could of interest around the Dingle Peninsula that could really help awaken one's senses. Like when you say a sensory garden, it's all about, um, I suppose, using uh, the community to kind of give their ideas as well. So using and the question to schools can really open up um, how you approach this idea. Like our aim is really to try and um, incorporate the community's, um, I suppose, voluntary ideas, as well as getting the schools involved in their own. At the moment, it's very achievable, I think, this idea, because people are are really covered up with their masks and they realize how much they want to use their senses when they take the mask off it's like, oh, fresh air and we're all so locked down in our own locations that we really i suppose have come to the realization that we have to appreciate what we have around us and try and really i suppose try and get that community to come to come together and utilize it as a space so um just for an example we had anna stall who there's an idea of developing, you know, the area around Town Queen statue in the Memorial Garden. It's lovely with the river, got the sounds, got the nature as well, birds. And it's just a really lovely village to make people stop and actually take the story in about this hero or Kerry hero. So this sensory garden can be like a sensory, you know, experience, but also a, like a learning tool. So it kind of, branches into, a, you know, I have another picture there across from, I only own auto sit in my own town. I'm here so long now over the last few months across from the medical centre. There's a beautiful space to, to develop what's right there. The photograph shows there's already a garden space, but it's only now we're only realising what's around us. So it's a really good opportunity right now to get people interested and in seeing what's nearby. Um, census, well, we have our taste and touch and sound and scent. So trying to awaken these senses would be really, um, I suppose, planting the right things and having the right textures, but also it's about having the right people to protect it and actually instill good values. So, you know, there would be a, a link between the present and the past, which is with stories, of course, with Tom Crean and so on. And it would encourage different generations to come together and listen to legendary and historical stories about the area and individual characters from it. You could say it's kind of taking the tour guide out of it, but the different communities in Ireland, the Irish don't really need a tour guide. They really need to come and learn about a place 
um, in their own, I suppose, way. So the different communities in different parts of the peninsula develop their own sensory garden based on the distinct features in their own community. For example, the Maharese might focus on the sea, Castle Gregory might focus, focus on local agricultural produce, like the carrots there, fabulous or award-winning Mahari carrots on the menus around, so showcasing what the, the local producers are actually creating, their salty soil of the Stingle Peninsula. Now, the next step is a launching point. We would like to set up a pop-up sensory garden in Anaskal again, we would like to invite different stakeholders on this day. And many local schools, shanoris, community groups, tidy towns, committees, tourism development groups. I could go on local farmers and landowners, local historical societies, archaeological sites, the OPW, sister city groups, NEWKD, uh, these are like um, more the Dingle Way Committee, getting more local, Kerry County Council, they can showcase what could be possibly done in each area of the peninsula, like giving an ideas box on the box on the day and saying, feed me with feedback, and they can give their ideas and maybe it might not all be about making money for it. It might be a donation of your time and maybe, you know, like with how successful the tidy towns have been and how much of an impression it makes on the visitor overseas and they come to Ireland and see how beautiful the natural island is like even the hedgerows are full of colour so people want to know what things are and the Irish know a lot of us the locals and the natives and everyone sharing this island have actually know a lot of old cures and things like this uh, with these amazing uh, plants and flowers so it's like getting the excitement going by an event like this. There would be different plants and local resources for people to touch, smell, and a walk through sensory tent for people to have a hands-on eye, hands-on and their eyes are blindfolded experience of these resources. And I used to run these sensory um, tents in children's festivals and it was very exciting. And the children wanted to go again and again. So you'd have queues of people with their mom and dad, all excited hearing it what is going on in that tent and it just was exciting to see how excited they got about trying again imagine children never want to do something again straight away but that is a way to gauge people's um, I suppose motivation to help or even getting um, ideas together with different resources from the area so they could be bringing buckets of seaweed I see kids walking through with that lovely feeling so it's all about, I get quite excited talking about it, but I couldn't do all this on my own anymore. <laughs> I've tried to, with adventure centres and it's been difficult, but if it's open and sensory and it belongs to people, then it should work. Um, this idea of having a storyteller in hand tell stories about the local area to create more work and people from the locality will have a bit of excitement. We would also have a, our chance to really kind of use that space because sensory gardens have proven to be great for people with dementia, people with special needs. And if it's an open space where people come in and actually utilize, then it's going to be a success story and it's going to add to the story. If you really think about it, like this to show you the next slide, there is an old example of what a garden, sensory garden can offer. It's a nice visual display, but there's so many lovely groups that could volunteer their time to create these and even maybe donate like mint plants, so much mint growing around the place. People can actually donate from their own gardens on that day, which would be an exciting thing to actually think of. You know, um, people can donate time or even tools to make things. And it's very achievable even, you know, in January onwards, you know, it's, we don't want to lose the momentum on it. And there's a load of people are taking up gardening. So it's an exciting time. And I've just included a few images of, on the next slide of what you can do, very simple things. And again, the little art space for children, you know, it's social distancing again at its finest. They can be actually quite inspired to be, you know, painting something um, up close and you're really looking closely at nature. So it's just, again, I um, think it would speak for itself if you got a chance to, to see it on the day. We should definitely get a date down for holding a pop-up event. I have the old sensory tent at home. It's a big 12-man scout tent canvas. So yeah, 
let's get this journey going, you know. It's very exciting to see how it's marrying with the other um, ideas on this, like what you're branching to the academy next. You know, the learning tool here is very, very effective when you see how you could maybe have an entrance to the garden where it's very exciting. It's all uh, maybe sculptures from like environmental art or recycled materials. Then you go into the play zone or the relaxation area. So it's trying to make enough space in the garden for a quiet space and then maybe one area for real play and then a kind of tends to really review the experience. So it might come all in one go, but if you could start to build in one garden and then it could be actually showing you the journey at the very end, you could have a mini model of the peninsula of the gardens or else just a mini model of the town and its energy and how it's actually 2030, what the angel will look like, you know, and it could be a thing that's going to be additional okay, over 10 years, what it's going to look like. We should be starting as soon as we can because it's going to be an exciting journey to watch. And uh, again, there's stakeholders and people to be getting involved with. Um, that's not really my area of expertise, but there's so many good people on this peninsula. So hopefully you start connecting and hopefully you'll actually get a, a chance to, to link in with some of the actual ideas and uh, we could get some competitions going at school level. So it's exciting times and I hope you'll actually follow um, uh, this idea is true in your own garden, start collecting colours in nature now. It's a fabulous time in Ireland. Um, big storms coming up. So, you know, it's like shopping on the beach down here in Dingle. So, you know, we want the Dingle police to speak to us, to tell us to kind of stay push and enjoy what we have and start getting involved in ideas like this. So, Gaurav Meal and Mahogad, Zapdina. And I think I'm really, really happy to be involved in such a exciting project let's just get it going it's long of all curve market curve me the man good to uh dave you should in kahoot and uh i think you're so right i think the the idea is very very achievable um and i certainly know of ways that we can support getting those first steps off the ground and helping to bring um, the stakeholders together. So um, I know that there is many, pe many people in many areas in the peninsula already interested in this concept. So maybe proving it in one area will show the way for others. So exciting times ahead, as you said. Yeah, excellent. So, yeah. So now we're going to move to Cheryl Donahue, who is going to speak to us about the Dingle Energy Academy. Um, Cheryl is a writer and a website usability specialist. And so she's another lovely example of a mix of uh, creativity and technology here on the peninsula. She's also one of our Coder Dojo mentors uh, and so helps inspire the next generation of creative technologists. So over to you, Cheryl, to tell us about the Energy Academy for the Dingle Peninsula. OK, thanks, Deirdre. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, our group was myself, uh, Katrina Fallon and Leah Dawn Slattery. And uh, we came up with the idea of a Dingle Energy Academy that's based on the, the existing Sanso Energy Academy. Uh, Sanso is a small island off the coast of Denmark. Um, about, well, in 1997, they, uh, they won uh, a bid uh, to become sort of a, an energy center. And 10 years later, uh, they were completely self-sufficient. Um, the Energy Academy is sort of the, the center of their efforts. And we think that Dingle is kind of uniquely positioned and has unique talents that would uh, make an academy like that work here as well. Uh, we already have a number of initiatives going on that deal with sustainable energy. Uh, Deirdre mentioned a few of these earlier. Uh, we have the electric car initiative. Uh, there's the home, home heating energy initiative and some of the agriculture initiatives also deal with uh, reducing um, energy footprint. Um, if you can pop on to the next slide. Uh, a couple of reasons why we think this would work particularly well in Dingle. The first is that it's obviously, it's a place that people already want to come to. And if we have um, a forward-looking uh, academy that's looking at making this place uh, and, and surround, and perhaps all of Ireland at some point, um, energy independent and particularly uh, 
um, sorry, with a particular view on sustainable energy, you know, uh, wind and solar, uh, might attract people to come here and stay here longer to find out what's going on, and maybe it would even attract people who want to live and live here more full-time residents who want to live in a place. Uh, secondly, our location is obviously conducive to uh, uh, wind energy in particular, and I know we have talent on the peninsula is already uh, looking at wind energy onshore and offshore. Uh, and we are also home to two universities, which I think is fairly amazing for such a tiny place. Uh, and if we pull in the talent uh, and just the academic resources from both UCC and Sacred Heart, uh, that would also give us a head start on developing our own little academy. Um, I think, you know, what we, if we created uh, something along these lines in Dingle, it obviously has the potential to um, uh, just for to make Dingle a self-sustaining place, but we have the potential then to be a model uh, for the rest of the country and also to interact with people internationally who are doing the same thing. So it, it's, uh, it's not just for the peninsula, it's also looking out nationwide and it will help us kind of get more international context and bring more people in. Uh, the first step that we thought we should do is actually invite the person who is uh, kind of the sustaining force behind the Energy Academy in sound, so, uh and invite him to come to Dingle and, and have a talk uh, because they have been doing this for, what did I say, 1997, more than 20 years, been very successful and in particular they are very focused on bringing uh, everybody in, you know, getting buy-in for everybody uh, in the community to what this would involve. And I, I understand he's also a very charis charismatic person, so uh, it would be a good talk to go to. Uh, and I think there's also, there is a potential for job creation uh, just in the academy itself. I know the Samsung Academy has, um, I think they have eight full-time employees at this point, but also just in sustainable uh, resources, in, in retrofitting homes, in possibly sustainable tourism, and in innovations uh, in energy efficiency. Um, and that's where I'll leave it. Hopefully we can get Soren here. Uh, Katrina apparently has already made uh, some contact with Soren and one of his associates, so uh, we, we, we do have some contacts with them already, mm -hmm. and hopefully we could get that going shortly. I'll give it back to you, Deirdre. Thank you very much for that, Cheryl. I agree totally. This is um, something that we are halfway en route to already. I mentioned engaged research before. Um, we have a lot of research under our belt in the area of energy. We will be moving forward to try and um, implement community-owned energy here. We have close relationships with the educational institutes around us. Um, and as you said, Katrina has already um, made links with Soren and um, it's something that was very suitable in their community and I think I, I don't see why it's not possible and achievable here uh, with a lot of benefits coming from it. I'm going to move on next to um, Barry Bambury um, who they have a lovely idea here. Um, Barry is an energy engineer who has recently joined a new startup um, energy efficiency company called DC6 Technologies. Um, the company will be based from Dingle and we're looking forward to having him working alongside us uh, as the company grows. Um, he's going to tell us about Dingle 2029. Uh, I am of Dingle. Over to you, Barry. Thanks very much, Deirdre. I am. Cheers, Deirdre. Uh, so I was in Group F, there was Joe McGuire, Deanne O'Connor, Mary Furter, and myself. So when we started off, we started talking about, um, I suppose, what it meant to be from Dingle, what are the shared values the people of Dingle hold, and what, I suppose, what makes Dingle unique, really. And then the conversation went to, I suppose, the history of Dingle, and the, the people in my group had great knowledge and the thousands of years of well-documented history there of Dingle and the surrounding areas. But one, one thing we really started to talk about was the Treaty of Dingle that was written in 1529 and as we discussed it we saw a lot of parallels between what happened back in 1529 and we saw an opportunity that the 500 year anniversary of this is coming up in 2029 
and could we commemorate this? And could we, could we look at what they did back in 15, 20, 20, 15, 29 and do something similar for ourselves? And I suppose a quick history lesson. So I'm embarrassed to say I knew absolutely nothing about Tracy Dingle during the workshop, but I was educated. So back in 1329, the Earl of Desmond took over administrative control over that area in the blue there, so West Kerry, North Kerry, and so East Park. And then by the end of the century, he took over full control, which was no easy feat because the people of Kerry at the time were known as being particularly difficult to control. Fast forward to 1520, you can see there Henry VIII and Cardinal Woosley. They were trying to take over this area at the time. And this, as you can imagine, was met by great opposition from the Earl of Desmond, because I suppose they were known for their tyranny and oppression at the time. So what the Earl of Desmond did was he reached out and tried to make a connection with Charles V, who was the King of Spain at the time. Uh, what he did was he sent over a couple of lads in a boat with some Irish world phones and Irish falcons that were raised in the Blasket Islands, just in the hope that they'd reach San Sebastian and they could make a connection with Charles V. Uh, and thankfully, they were, these, these gifts were very well received. Uh, Charles V then sent over uh, Ambassador Fernandez, that's the guy here in 1529. When he arrived in Dingle, he noted a couple of things, but one of the first things he noted was the role of women in society. He noted that women had a much more equal role in Dingle in 1529 than they had back in Spain, so I was delighted to hear that. And I suppose he met then with the Earl of Desmond at Dingle, and between himself and the Earl created the Treaty of Dingle. And what the treaty was, was it, was a, it gave the people under the Earl of Desmond, co-equality with the people of the Habsburg country. So you can kind of see this as something very similar to what we have in the EU today, something that was way before its time. And what this treaty did was it addressed the challenges people had of Dingle in 1529 by reaching out and making connections. So I suppose that's what we want to do. When we move forward, I suppose our next slide is about creating a Dingle charter. So you can just click on there. The, the Dingle Charter, if you can just click on to the next slide, cheers, Deirdre. So the Dingle Charter, we want to look at the past, look at our present and look at the future. So when we're looking backwards, we're looking first of all at the language, obviously very unique for Gael to carry. We want to hang on to our language and build upon it and make it stronger. As well as that, we have many ancient traditions and ancient culture. Some of these are very strong and living today, but some of them might have fallen by the wayside. And we see this Dingle Charter as an opportunity to, to re revive these traditions that might have fallen away. And then one I've already mentioned is equality. That was something I was delighted to hear. And we want to make this front and centre of our Dingle 2029 charter. Bringing it into today, then, the very centre of this whole Dingle charter is this whole idea of I am of Dingle and making connections. So the concept behind I am of Dingle, it doesn't necessarily mean you're from Dingle or you have ancestry in Dingle. It's much more of an abstract idea. So it could be just your parents told you a story about their vacation or their honeymoon or whatever in Dingle. It's this idea that there are people out there have these abstract connections with Dingle and we want to foster these connections. We want to do this in both a digital and a physical environment when we're able to do it again. So digital, we're thinking like online, we can create a hashtag of I am of Dingle on Twitter just to get people making these connections. And then, of course, when we're able to have our events again, we'll be able to have physical stands, maybe at Dingle Food Festival, other voices, whatever. And then hopefully what we'll be hoping is that these connections, just like the, the 1529 uh, Dingle treated that this will foster trade and this will enable more businesses to trade um, into the future. And then finally, the last pillar of the Dingle Charter is sustainability. So I suppose the key things to mention in sustainability are energy, agriculture, man maritime, transport and tourism. And this matches up very nicely with the work that the Dingle Hub are doing for 2030. And 2029 is not that far off 2030. So I think there's an opportunity there for some parallel stuff to be carried, to be captured within the Dingle Charter. And I suppose just to summarise it then all again in one sentence, the whole idea is building on connections to address the problems of today, just like they did back in 1529. So I suppose that's it really. Thanks thanks very much, Deirdre. Thanks for everyone's time this evening. Thanks, Barry. That's great altogether. I love the idea of I am of Dingle and making those connections because as we've seen over the summer months, so many people have um, so much, uh, I suppose, <laughs> affection for the place and feel such a connection to, to the place um it really would be brilliant to to bring that together and it can be done in a very very achievable way and linking it to the 2029 is quite exciting as well so thanks for that very um now last but not least is david garner who is a renewable energy consultant and he's considerable experience in offshore wind projects he's one of our community energy mentors and he's a great guy to have around if we want to 
pursue community owned energy projects. Um, so David's going to talk to us about what's possible with uh, Playground of Discoveries. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, yeah, just to give you a little bit of background, the, the, the project team was myself, Miriam Ferreter, Stacey O'Connor and Katrina Nikonon. We started with the idea of how do we extend the tourist season and, and how do we bring different types of visitors to the peninsula and how do we get them to stay longer um, in the off season. So we started to think about, um, if you like, team building and that developed into the idea of having perhaps companies turn up and have residencies here, sort of send their staff for weeks at a time where they could come here to work, but also to play, to absorb everything we have to offer on the Dingle Peninsula. So, so this brought us around to this idea of a playground of discovery. Um, and, and in reality, we're starting to think about how we can host the world's most creative conference. Um, so our pitch to uh, the businesses is, is that they should really imagine um, a little bit about the Dingle Peninsula being a space where they can actually explore more than just their own business. They can explore their mind, their imagination. They can come here to explore all the great things around the peninsula, the landscape, the beauty. Um, obviously, everybody knows about the Dingle Peninsula. There's a lot of creative people. We have innovators, we have farmers, fishermen and artists. So we'd really like to bring together a meeting of, of minds between uh, businesses from outside the peninsula who, who can send staff here, who can come here for conferences, but actually getting them engaged with all of the people on the peninsula. Um, we think that we, we can really host interesting conferences here. Um, and we're, we're going to call this the playground of discovery. We've even got a little um, website there. Don't, don't click on it. There's, there's nothing out that URL. Uh, Deirdre, maybe you can just move on to the next slide for me. So our unique proposition was really around this, this idea to start with a, a, as a, of a conference. Um, we want to make sure that it's not just the same old conference that anyone who's ever been to a conference will know that they're pretty dull. There's normally about two hours, which are interesting over, over two days and you just drink far too much coffee. So we want to make sure there's some kind of uh, process and involvement in, in the people of the peninsula alongside the businesses that come here. So, so they can do things like networking with future customers. They can do networking with, with in, within their industry and it, and it involves a little bit more than just swapping a, a business card and, and, and meeting some, you know, someone else who's a bit bored like, like yourself, as happens at a typical conference. Um, the team building as well, we don't want that just to be something really dull that reminds you of, of an episode of The Office. We want that to be engaging with, with artists. We want it to be engaging with the landscape. Um, so we really want to use everything that the peninsula has to offer, culture, landscape, history, the unique people, the arts, um, all of the talents here on the peninsula to actually uh, make sure these businesses want to come here and keep sending people here for weeks at a time. Um, so yeah, we got a very simple plan. Um, we, we need to bring together a lot of different stakeholders on the peninsula to design this kind of conference. It's not just uh, the hotels and the B&Bs and, and the restaurants. We need to look at all the businesses and the artists and work out what everybody can offer. So to that step two, we would put out an open call to all the talent on the Dingle Peninsula for ideas. Um, what could you offer that would make these conferences or these long business stays unique? Um, we need to do some market research in step three, just testing that concept with uh, a potential business, a potential conference. One of the first ideas we had was, could we look at a conference for uh, electric cars, uh, for hydrogen transport um, on, on the basis that, that you might be able to get quite a large amount of people sort of coming to Dingle from different businesses. Um, that there's a concept that happens very similar in Sweden. Uh, in, in the Arctic Circle in Sweden, I think there's a month or two in the winter where half the European car industry descends to the middle of nowhere because they developed this idea that this would be the place to test cars in the winter. So that's the kind of thing we're thinking about in the long run. It becomes repeatable and, and sort of whole industries should perhaps turn up for weeks at a time to interact with each other, but also with us on the peninsula. Um, yeah, step four, coordinate and, and the running and hosting of the, end, of the event, which sounds nice and simple. Um, and of course, then we, we have to just launch it and, and review it. So yeah, that's it. Go with Mila, everybody, um, and thank you. Thanks very much, David. That's great. We're not doing too bad on time now. What we want to do is they're all of the ideas that have emerged from this workshop to date. As I have mentioned, it's not all of the ideas to help build a vision, but it is a fantastic starting point. 
I'm going to get Vitter to share with us now um, a way that those of you watching here tonight can maybe uh, make a comment on an idea, contribute. Um, so we need to share this link with everyone here. So we're going to send a link to all panelists and to NDs and hopefully you can see that link and uh, um, it should be super straightforward um, I'm going to share my screen again yeah, so maybe that you can better. see it and if everyone wants to click on that link all of the ideas are there I'm sure I'll let you uh, let's let's try to do in sync. So the basically we placed all the ideas around the board, and this is kind of like a digital whiteboard. So zoom in, zoom out um, to get um, to to be able to read <laughs> the ideas. You see, zoom in, zoom out, and then the way you can give a feedback is by taking a stick note. Uh, we left a few there. Uh, you can also just add or you can copy and paste one uh, stick note and um, write your own. You see um, some activities already happening. Um, I think the, the point here is um, it's not only to give feedback uh, to each idea, but it's almost like how to start a conversation around those ideas. And that can also go a little bit more um, deep and maybe you wanna share um, contact or another person that you think should be uh, involved. So I think it's beyond just giving feedback. It's beyond just saying if, it, if you like or not, this is not, the board of likes and dislikes is the board of like, uh, sometimes is uh, an idea that made you think about something else, share that with us. I think each idea is a little bit of like a seed. Uh, so help us understand what can grow out of that. Um, this is going to keep, it's going to stay open even after we finish this um, session. That means you, you guys can keep going and, and, and talking and maybe enter another day. Just be mindful that it's an open link. It means anyone with that link can enter and do things. Uh, so just be, be mindful when sharing that link and also when you move things around. But other than that, um, I just hope you can uh, engage and, and, and start a conversation around some of these ideas. They're really at least from my uh, experience so far, really inspiring. And there is like really um, a very committed group behind each of those ideas. Um, but I think that's it. Thank you very much, Fisher. Um, so as Fisher has said, um, that link is going to stay open. Uh, we may password protect it um, in the near future, just so we don't lose any of your feedback. But please feel free to continue after this session has ended. If you have an idea tomorrow morning, you can just pop it in on a sticky note there. Let us know if there are ideas that you can contribute to and get in, involved with. So we're close enough to, to time now. And uh, with that, I suppose I just want to I'd like to thank all of our speakers here this evening, all of their group members who took part in the workshop, um, and all of you for listening as well. Um, I'm bringing this session to a close, but I'm hoping that it's just the start of working together to build this vision. So with strong collaborations already established in the areas of agriculture, energy, 
transport and tourism, I think there are many, many opportunities to find resources to make these ideas a reality. Um, but they can really only happen with the strength of the community behind them. And once we know what the community wants. As I mentioned already, we've recorded this session and we'll send the link to all the registered participants and we'll place it on the Kirkagoina Fehatruka website. So please share it with anyone else you know who may be interested and please bring these ideas to anyone's attention that you feel would like to get involved. Um, so continue to contribute to our Miro board afterwards or you can register your interest on the workshop web page that we, we sent that link with the invite um, and that can be found on Kirkugaina Fehatruka as well or you can simply send us an email at info at dinglehub.com to get involved. So thanks again everyone for your time. Good night. <laughs>